Bible Answers with Dr. Al Garza. All right, welcome back to another edition of Bible Answers Unfiltered. I am your host, Dr. Al Garza. So today I'm going to be discussing uh, a debate between that took place a couple of days ago by doc, between Dr. White and Dr. Flowers on the topic of, of John 644 and unconditional election. And Dr. White, of course, affirms the positive, while Dr. Flowers, of, of course, affirms the negative. Now, this debate um, was a very interesting debate because it, you get to see how a Calvinist, a Reformed Calvinist like Dr. White, approaches the text that he believes is uh, teaching unconditional election as a Reformed Calvinist. And you can see how he does this in a way of, of going verse by verse, uh, drawing on some of the Greek, uh, giving you a little bit of a Greek analysis and how some of this stuff works in order. Now, Dr. White's whole uh, argument is based on following the order of the text, verse by verse by verse. And by doing so, you, you can only arrive at uh, unconditional election. Now, of course, Dr. Flowers gives a whole presentation, uses the Bible as a whole, uh, cross does some cross-referencing, parallel verses. Uh, he does some, do some language, touches on some other scholarly sources. And that's typically how you do exegesis. Uh, and even in basic hermeneutics, you, you, you use all the tools that are available. Now, Dr. White didn't use all the tools. He simply just gave his interpretation. He went verse by verse. He gave an interpretation that he believed the text is saying. Uh, and then, of course, relied more on the Greek. And that was it. Uh, again, I think Dr. Flowers did a better job handling the, the verse by, by doing proper exegesis, which is the basic foundation for any interpretation. But something struck me. I've made a – this is interesting. For um, individuals who have been asking me when I'm going to do this video, uh, I've actually did a couple prior to this one, and I had to throw them in the trash because – there are some other things that I thought about and realized that, that I didn't put in the video. And so uh, I, things that I felt were very important that needed to be said uh, regarding the passage uh, that I don't think people would get the full picture unless I talked about it. So I'm going to try and touch on some of that. I don't want to go too long. I know people like to go two hours, an hour. I do want to keep it short as best I can, but I want to get to the main points. So dealing with Dr. White's methodology of interpretation here. Uh, and even during the cross-examination, he focused on verse by verse, line by line. And to him, when he came to verse 44 and 45, he tried to, uh, you know, pretty much get Dr. Flowers to admit that 44 comes before 45, and 44 uh, happens uh uh, verse 44 basically um, shows the result of 45. So 45 is the result of 44. So how Dr. White explains this in the debate as well as in his post-debate, he says, no one is able to come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Dr. White says that because of that, the result of 44 45 happens. It is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught of God. So the ones that are taught by God are the ones that are drawn to the, to the, to him by the father. The father will uh, draw those and send them to the son. So no one is able to come to me unless the father sent him, draws him. And I, Jesus, I will raise up the last day. So the drawing happens. And when, once 44 happens, then 45 takes, takes effect. Okay, so the order is 44, the action, and the effect of 44 is 45. So, and then of course, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So 44 is the action, and 45 is the effect of 44. Now, this is interesting because something came to me, uh, and I was thinking about this, this is why I kind of trashed the other videos, is that Pro, this this is considered messianic prophecy in Jewish circles. In the in the uh, Targum, uh, this passage in Isaiah, Isaiah fifty four thirteen is considered messianic. The Targum puts this as saying that, and all your sons will be will be learning Torah from God. Uh, so learning Torah, basically talking about Israel. Now, chapter 44, previously 53, 
this is all mess this is considered messianic 54 goes down to 13 speaking to israel and all your sons in hebrew will be taught will be disciples taught as disciples by the lord so when jesus references isaiah he's referencing a messianic prophecy something that's going to take place on behalf of israel now so everyone who has heard and learned from the father as a jew will come or be led and drawn to the messiah now i say it's because dr white in his post debate rejected the interpretation that this is referring to israel even though jewish sources the targum the hebrew itself is all reflective of israel being the one spoken of at the messianic era which jesus is basically saying the time is now um, james white rejects that there's no scholarly sources he gives nothing to substantiate that it's pretty much his interpretation what, what's interesting is that dr white is relying strictly on his own interpretation his own understanding that's it he's not referencing scholarly sources he's not referencing the hebrew the aramaic the languages jewish sources nothing he's not consistent in the way he does does interpret the trinity and the deity which he talks about you have to be consistent because when he talks about those topics he goes to the sources to the to the scholarly and uh, greek and hebrew scholars and he'll even reference some jewish sources how they understand these things and he'll go through the whole exegesis toolbox but here it's all about james white reading it and interpreting it and you can see this in his post debate he makes the same claim but this is messianic prophecy now we know this uh because again jewish sources that the targum you know the hebrew the way it reads the context of isaiah um this is all speaking about the jews and how god himself will draw israel men of israel people of israel who are true disciples and followers to the messiah he'll lead them to him and this continues on in the book of acts this is being fulfilled now in prophecy if you look at all the instances of prophecy in the scripture you'll always have uh the action taking place and then someone will describe and say this as this is written or this is to fulfill and this or as is written so prophecy is always mentioned in hindsight in the sense of this is being fulfilled or is fulfilled now this is how it works in john chapter one give me an example john is the one uh that they come to the the, the jews and they send uh, they send certain priests and Jews to, and Levites to John saying, are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Are you the Messiah? And he says, no, no, I'm not. He says, uh, John specifically says, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. So what do we have here? We have, of course, uh, John referencing Isaiah that he is fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah, but he's what he's doing comes before the fulfillment because he has to fulfill the pro prophecy. That's how prophecy works. Prophecy gets fulfilled and then it gets referenced from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the foundation of the New Testament. So whenever you have prophecy mentioned in the New Testament, it's in fulfillment or being fulfilled. That's why they can say it. So the, the, the prophecy, which comes described at the end, explains what just took place so the prophecy explains what just happened it's being fulfilled or is fulfilled or it it can continue to be fulfilled this is in a jewish context remember jesus is speaking to jews in the synagogue of capernaum he came to the jew first to the lost sheep of the house of israel he did not he told his disciples don't go to the gentiles don't go anywhere else go to the lost sheep of the house of israel he rebukes the jews because they search the scriptures thinking they have life, et light, uh, eternal life in them. But he says, he says, it is this that testify of me and, and you are unwilling to come to me. John 5, 39, you are unwilling to come to me. And so that you may have life and I do not, and, and so forth. So the testimony of Jesus in verse 36, 37, 38, 39, all the way down where he says the accuser, the accuser will be Moses in whom, 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 in whom you set your hope you believe moses you would if for if you believe moses you would believe me for he wrote about me but if you do not believe his writings how will you believe my words and the greek is rhema so again prophecy 
Jews, Israel, coming. This is before the cross, before any of that. He's he's coming to the Jews first as as to fulfill the messianic prophecies of coming to his own people, bringing the Messiah. Of course, they're going to reject him. Some will follow him. He has disciples. But when he goes from the synagogues to the synagogues, he is definitely bringing the gospel that he is the Messiah. He shows miracles, signs, and wonders in Capernaum. They see them, but they don't believe. They see the miracles. They see what he did. Jesus says, you saw them, but you don't believe in me. You come to me because of what I did so you could eat. But he says in 35, I am the bread of life. He who, the one who comes to me and the one who believes in me will not hunger and will never thirst. That's the metaphor for eternal life. Then he talks about who the Father gives. So all that the Father gives me will come to me. This is not all as in Gentiles. Gentiles are grafted in. They're not even mentioned here. They're mentioned as being grafted in. The Gentiles come in by faith, where the Jews are pursuing righteousness by the Torah and not by faith. That's what Paul says in Romans 9. So he accuses them because they're not believing in him. And only those who are true disciples, as spoken of by Isaiah, will come to him. And he will raise them up on the last day. That is why the drawing, this is what Calvinists have to do. I want any Calvinist out there to show me where the word draw is used in the sense of regeneration, rebirth, born from above. In any lexicon or Greek dictionary, it's not going to happen. You will not find it. The word, when it says, all of the Father gives me, the word give does not entail regeneration. That's an interpretation Re, re, um, uh, the re, the reinterpret, the uh, the redefining of these words is what a Calvinist do. Now, you can look at different Greek uh, lexicons and commentaries on this. Uh, one, of course, is uh, a trench on synonyms of the New Testament. He says, of course, referring to John, that this type of drawing is is not the way the Calvinists look at it as regeneration. It's this this has no meaning of that. Uh, he makes a point of saying that this is more of a divine attraction of divine attractions of his love. Uh, so it's not a force, but by divine attractions of his love. And so he's making the point that, again, this is not saying exactly what they want um, unless they redefine the Greek words and have to fit it into the text. And then they have to redefine prophecy because prophecy comes in an order. All throughout scripture, if you look carefully, examine the prophecies, even in John, Matthew, Mark, and the Gospels, it takes the action, whatever's happening is then referenced in fulfillment. The prophecies are written in the Old Testament there first. Everything is there. Then it becomes fulfilled. It's like if I have a cup or a jar, here's the prophecy. There's a jar. It's empty. I get water and I fill the jar. The, the water is, of course, the New Testament, what's being fulfilled of the Messiah. And then, of course, it's complete. The Messiah fulfills these prophecies. They're going to reject him. He's going to die and open the door for all people to come to him by faith. That's why I'm the, when he, he prophesies in, uh, I think it's in John chapter 12, that when he is lifted up, he, he, he says, I will draw all men to myself. The same Greek word there, but it's used in a sense now of at the at the crucifixion which is death burial resurrection now i will draw all men i will lead all men to me again in the hebrew in the aramaic and in the greek the word draw can also be translated as to lead so they'll all be led to the messiah he says i will do it. it's not longer the father why isn't it the father now because here in the context of the jews they are under the covenant of god the father and the old testament so they understand that they're trying to, you know, they think they're righteous. They think they're keeping the Torah. They do all these things. That's why Jesus says, you know, you, you know, you, in your heart, you're far from me. You honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. You're hypocrites. Uh, they're on the outside. They want to look a certain way, but on the inside, they're dead bones. So this is why he tells them in, in John 6, you do not believe. The one who comes to me, the one who believes he will never go. He will not never thirst or be hungry. Eternal life will be given to him. And then, of course, all that the Father gives me will come to me. The Father will give those who are true disciples as prophesied by Isaiah. And again, no one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent or who leads, draws him, I will raise him up. 
the no one there i know the the, the calvin text says this is I'm talking about everyone this is a universal decree blah 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 james white likes to say that but that's only if you define draw as regeneration you have to look at it that way you have to reinterpret it you will not find it anywhere that way so unless you do that and you and you redefine how prophecy is spoken of in the scripture in a proper order that's why 55 we look at that first because that is prophecy it was already written and it's being fulfilled or it's going to be fulfilled so 45 we do take that as being first remember there's, technically there's no chapter and verses um you have to look at the context what's being said here but you'll always find in almost every prophecy the prophecy is mentioned at the end but which came first the prophecy or the fulfillment ask any calvinist that there is not one christian person that i would say that would dare say that fulfillment comes before prophecy that makes no sense that is truly backward reading and that's what's going on in john 6 by the calvinists prophecy is written down it's in the past they point to that as it's being fulfilled or is fulfilled so this in this context is being fulfilled and continues to be fulfilled because those who are true disciples of god will be drawn to the messiah and again even you see this with simeon you see it uh, even later on at, in the book of Acts, continuation of, of, of Cornelius, a Gentile, who, be, who, was, uh, who believed in the God of Abraham and Jacob and gave alms. And God sent him, sent Peter to him and his house to share the gospel message in a vision, Lydia, and so on. But in the gospels, the messianic prophecies, this is how prophecy is given. This is how prophecy is understood. And it's given in the proper order. So, yes, we can look at 45 as being what was written already before 44 fulfills it, the action. Again, you, here's how I look at it in a category. You have prophecy number one. Number one, prophecy. 1A, the subcategory, would be the fulfillment, New Testament verses, what's going on, the action behind it. That action is fulfilling the prophecy of number one. Calvinists reverse it. They want to put what is being said in verse 44, the, what's being fulfilled, what's being done, as a way of 1a then prophecy that's the result oh look and dr white says this and is and is not only in his debate but also in his in his predate that that 44 that because that happens that drawing that elect that regeneration 45 then takes effect that they shall be taught of god everyone who has heard and learned from the father will come to him in the sense that that is the effect of it so they have it back they're the ones who actually have it backwards they put fulfillment and then 1a prophecy that is not this is this would be the only place in the entire new testament where this is read backwards you have prophecy first number one and then 1a fulfillment prophet now and prophecy is always mentioned after the fact just like here in john 6 44 and 45. you saw that in first john i can go through every time verse where this this is to fulfill or this is, i mean you can see this in the book of matthew more in john i mean this continues on and on and on and even when paul says something about being fulfilled again he references something that's already happened so the so the so the prophecy is explaining what is has just taken place so 45 which is already written in the past by isaiah explains what just happened in 44 and even previously what's going to happen to israel and the jews how how would they be led and drawn to the messiah It'll be done by God. If they are true disciples and they believe God will draw them and lead them to the Messiah, they'll be given to the Messiah, not regenerated, not born again first, not elect Jews, Gentiles, everybody. Because Gentiles, remember again, are grafted in. They come by faith. They don't have the Torah. See that in Romans chapter 2. They don't have the Torah. They have a conscience, but not Torah. And so they come by faith. Jews... Hellenistic Jews who read the Torah, whether it's in Hebrew or Septuagint, they come that way. Now, Dr. White only appeals to the Septuagint, which I think is kind of funny. In his post-debate, you'll see him appeal only to the Septuagint and give his interpretation, ignoring the Hebrew, ignoring the Aramaic, ignore, which Aramaic is a commentary of the Hebrew Scriptures. So it says specifically that Isaiah 54, 13 is speaking to the children of Israel who will learn Torah. He ignores that. He, he ignores Jewish interpretation, which in my book here, Calvinism Challenge, I quote Jewish sources on this very verse, how this is messianic to them. They say, referring to, uh, referring to Isaiah, 
uh, of course, Isaiah 53. I'm sorry. Let's go back here, Isaiah 54. Um, so they they look at this. Uh, they look at Isaiah 54, 13 as a Messianic prophecy when it says, and they shall all be they shall all be disciples of God. They say concerning for this is the will of my, for this is the will of my father. Oops, sorry, wrong one. I'm reading the verse. They are truly referring to Isaiah. They are truly taught of God from whom prophecy comes, which does not at all to the world, which is not to the world, but to Israel only, and of whom it is written, and all thy children are taught of God, basically taught as disciples of God. They reference Isaiah as being a messianic verse. Now, Dr. White doesn't touch on that. He only goes to the Greek and his interpretation. He puts himself as the standard authority. No scholarly sources. F.F. F. Bruce has a great book on the Gospel of John refuting what, what Dr. White says about it. Uh, there are other scholars. So this is Dr. White comes to the debate with just himself and his Greek and says, this is what it means. Take it or leave it. If you don't agree with me, you're, you're somewhere else. Dr. Flowers goes, this proper exegesis, what Dr. White did is, is lazy exegesis, relying on himself, where Dr. Flowers gave a, a whole picture. So unless you reinterpret the words, draw and give, unless you redefine prophecy on how it's given in its context of always mentioned at the end, like in 54, so you can't go by order, which prophecy is written before the New Testament. So there's no chapter verses, prophecy is already written. That's your one. One A is the fulfillment, what you find here to Israel. And even though Dr. White doesn't want to acknowledge that it's about Israel, the whole New Testament and the Old Testament confirms these are Messianic verses before the death, burial, and resurrection, before Gentiles were being grafted in. Jesus is fulfilling the Messianic world to the children of Israel. This is why Paul says it's to the Jew first. And that they're still elect of God, even in Romans, when he confirms that. So, to redefine prophecy, redefine terms, ignore the context, ignore Jewish sources, all these things is the problem that Dr. White has. So, the prophecies, you cannot go in order and say that verse 44 or 45 is a result of 44 in the sense that 44 happens and then 50, 40, uh, 44 and then 45 is a result. Uh, no, that's backwards. Okay, forty-five has already been written. It's already been. It's already been prophesied. Forty-four is fulfilling forty-five, which predates forty. Verse forty-four. So God is going. No man is able to come to me unless the Father who sent him draws or leads me. Again, I prefer lead because that's in the Aramaic and the Hebrew reflects back to the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, and Jesus is speaking Hebrew here, not Greek. So he would not use the Greek word. That's the other problem. Jesus would not have spoken this in or said this in reference in the Greek. He's not a Hellenistic Jew. We know this. Emmanuel Tov has brought out in great works how in Israel, within within Judea, at the temple and the, the local synagogues, they read the Hebrew scriptures only. We have no Septuagint fragments found there. They're only out more where the where Qumran is, where the Essenes were, but within Judea. We have the Hebrew scriptures. This is well known that the Jews would have been reading at the temple, at the synagogues, the Hebrew scriptures. Jesus would have been speaking Hebrew and not have said this in Greek. So your Greek, you can appeal to the Greek all you want as Calvinists, but he would have said this in Hebrew, which would have made more sense that no one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me leads him, leads him to him, and I will raise him up in the last day. He's the authority. He's the one who's going to bring the resurrection. And he says, it is, it is written, past tense, in the prophets. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father, not Gentiles here, it's talking about the Jews of Israel, will, uh, from the Father, comes to me. Because what Isaiah said will lead to him. The Father is the author of the scriptures. He's the one who teaches the people of Israel through the scriptures and the prophets and the Torah. They will lead. And that's why Paul tells Timothy, uh, or, sorry, Paul in Galatians, sorry, Galatians talks about how the Torah is a tutor that points to Christ. Uh, in Galatians here, this is interesting, uh, I mean, this, this is where we get in Galatians 3, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the Torah. Let me get my glasses here. Being shut up 
being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the Torah has become our tutor or our guardian to lead us to Christ, to Christ, to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. It becomes our tutor to Messiah. This is what leads you to Messiah, the Torah. Who wrote the Torah? God through Moses and the prophets. They are taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the, from the Father, the Jews, Israel, will come to the Son. God, he will lead them. That's how the text reads. So I'm sorry for Calvinists. You can't redefine how prophecy works in order, how prophecy is listed in that order. Uh, it doesn't supersede or get superseded by a previous verse that has nothing to do with it. The action of 44 does not interpret 45. The prophecy was already written that tells you what 44 and what God is doing. It is a fulfillment. So unless you want to redefine and put, take out the jar and just have water, you can't fit the jar in the water. You put the water in the jar. It becomes fulfilled or being fulfilled. So this is how we should come to this in a very... Uh, that is how biblical exegesis is, cultural context, cultural setting, backdrop, audience, list, language, the Bible as a whole, textual analysis, this whole thing, which Dr. White did not do. That is not consistent. He does it with the Trinity, the deity of the Messiah. But here, it's read it in order. I'm going to tell you what it says, and that's it. So Dr. Dr. Flowers did a great job. He laid the foundation, even in the cross-examination. Um, I think... He could have pressed Dr. White on some of this nonsense of word order, which doesn't fly in prophecy, uh, specifically when it's referencing the Old Testament, which it comes first. Uh, so this is what this is. This became the issue. And I I wanted to make this video because I wanted to touch on these things that I didn't touch when I made it before. So I had to scrap those. So I'm sorry this is coming out a little later. But this is how it works. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, please like and subscribe and share. I hope this helps give, at least give a little bit more light into the subject. But if you have any questions or comments, leave them here. You can email me. Uh, if you want to donate, this it helps the site. We can't grow without you guys. So if you want to donate, go to my website, which has a link down there, dralgarza.info. Uh, you can go to my blackbelttheology.com page. Uh, and you can also go to our Hebrew New Testament Studies page, which all the links are down here. And I'll leave a link for the debate, too, and, and, the, other, and the other post debate as well. But again, thank you for tuning in. Uh, hope everybody enjoyed this, and if you have any questions, again, leave them here. So thank you, and God bless. Bible Answers with Dr. Al Garza.